The USA's constitutionally enshrined love affair with firearms has given it the highest levels of private gun ownership in the world and a truly staggering rate of gun-related homicides. But it isn't just the US that's felt the effects. South of the border in Mexico, American sourced weapons have played a deadly role in that country's drug wars. Juliana Rufus has been to investigate. This is a shooting range in the southern United States. Here in Texas, shooting is a popular and competitive sport. Okay, you ready? It's my first time shooting a gun. Magazine goes in, make sure it's shouldered correctly. It's an assault rifle designed for warfare. There's your two shot, nine at uh, five o'clock. So I would have taken this person out, yes. he or she would be dead? Definitely. Today, an estimated 270 million guns are privately owned in the United States. Shooting ranges and gun shops are everywhere, and the arms industry is a multi-billion dollar business. But only a few miles south, across the border in Mexico, US sourced firearms are having a deadly effect. We have come to investigate how Mexican drug cartels exploit weak US gun laws to arm themselves with American weapons. Our journey begins in a hotel in the northern Mexican state of Tamaulipas. We have arranged to meet a group of people whose family members have gone missing. It's not known whether they are living or dead. The presence of drug cartels on the streets makes it too dangerous to meet them in an outside location. El nombre de mi hija es Serendida García Barrón y tiene para cinco meses desaparecida y hasta ahorita yo no sé nada de ella. Mi nombre es María Dolores Flores Velarde, él es mi hijo, José Guadalupe. La policía, lo único que sabemos es que salió a comer con una amiga y ya no regresó. But the odds of finding a family member alive are low. Since 2004, well over 150,000 people have been killed in Mexico's so-called war on drugs. Here in Tamaulipas, the Gulf Cartel and the Los Zetas Cartel are in a violent battle over the control of lucrative drug routes. Civilians are often forced to take sides or end up in the crossfire. Hay más de 5,000 cuerpos identificados en Tamaulipas, en las cosas comunes. Esos son los efectos de una una especie de guerra civil y que ahí están los uh, los resultados, pero que además que no se le ve fin. Many bodies haven't yet been found because it's too dangerous for investigators to search. The bodies that do get found end up here. Pues aquí es el servicio médico forense, aquí es el... At the state attorney general's office in the forensic autopsy center. So when did this body arrive? Este cuerpo llegó anoche. Es un homicidio provocado por disparos de arma de fuego. Aquí está un proyectil, aquí. The bullet traveled at such high speed, it continued to move once inside the body. It was fired from an assault rifle, like the AK-47 or AR-15, the cartel's favorite weapons. Faced with such deadly firepower, the Mexican police have taken on a paramilitary appearance. Captain Edgar Vallejo Arosa has agreed to show me what his officers have to deal with when battling heavily armed drug cartels. We've arrived here at a peak in the violence. Since April 2017, close to 100 people have been killed in Tamaulipas, including several police, so they are on high alert. Is this how you normally travel in a convoy? We never know when it's going to be an aggression, so, so we have to be prepared. The streets look deceptively quiet, but it's in transit where most attacks occur. You can see normal people walking and, and you never know who is plotting you. Yeah, so everybody could, could be a cartel informer. Exactly. The impact of the cartel's gun battles is clearly visible in residential areas. 
You can see the bullets over there and the, and the walls where, where it was a clash before. The cartels were inside. The police arrived and they started the, 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 the clash. At that time, there were like nine people killed. The violence has forced civilians from their homes. Those are like uh, empty houses, empty places where that they, they have decided to leave. Because of the violence? They, because of the violence. They'd rather go to another state of the Mexican Republic or to the United States in order to keep a better life. Next, Edgar takes us to the city's jail. He wants to show us that the cartel's weapons are everywhere. Barely two months before our visit, the jail was home to a massive armed riot. It's alleged that the weapons were smuggled in with the help of corrupt prison guards. They had like more than, I, I would say like 6,000 bullets inside. What, what weapons did the prisoners have? Long uh, guns, just like those. So similar to what similar you were to, carrying? Similar to, exactly. We could get some guns, but uh, unfortunately we know that uh, there are many guns inside that we don't know where they're ha hidden, you know? During the raid, seven people were killed. Four inmates, but also three police officers from Edgar's team. Can we go closer or is... ¿Qué tanto nos podemos acercar al, al... No problem. You're saying they still have guns inside, so... Oh, well, but uh, they won't be able to see us right now, so, so we control this, this side. Uh, and who controls the other side? We also control right now, we also control the, the other side. I'm very glad to hear. He's, he's in charge of the control right now. Mexico has very prescriptive gun laws, and weapons such as these are only legal in the hands of security forces. Yet the cartels seem to face no shortage of firepower. Nos topamos con cuatro camionetas con personas armadas que logró detener personal y armamento de ellos. Incluso fueron armas AK-47, R-15 y un calibre 50. Do you sometimes feel that the cartels, the other side, is better equipped than you are? These weapons have been collected by Mexican security forces from crime scenes. The cartels obtain firearms from a number of sources, including neighboring countries and China. But out of the serial numbers submitted to American authorities for tracing, 70% are tracked to purchases from U.S. gun shops. To take them out of circulation, the Tamaulipas government organizes regular destructions. The illegal flow of weapons across the border is a sensitive issue. Mexico and the US are heavily invested in trade. Victor Manuel Saenz, the governor's chief of staff, is in regular talks with his US colleagues. Hay una gran relación con el estado de Texas en particular y hemos hablado con la embajada de Estados Unidos, les hemos pedido que pongan mejor atención al tema de, de las armas, sobre todo la venta en el, en el, en el Valle de Texas. Específicamente, ¿en qué maneras crees que los americanos podrían su legislación de legislación para detener el flujo de armas que están llegando a la frontera? Obviamente, en un plano ideal, desearíamos que no se vendieran armas automáticas, que se vendieran exclusivamente armas para uso deportivo o de defensa en, 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 en la familia. Eh, pero bueno, si están autorizadas la venta de armas automáticas, que sean muy rigurosos eh, en su venta. We leave to follow the gun smuggling route back north. The authorities insist that we travel with an escort, as the closer you get to the US, the more dangerous it becomes. We've just reached the border city of Reynosa, and we've been told categorically that we can't film here. The cartels are fighting each other, and they're at war with the security forces. And then we reach the calm of the border queues. On the other side, it's another world. Here in the city of McAllen, it's much more peaceful, but suddenly gun stores are a common sight. They number nearly 5,000, the highest for any American state. This is the real deal right here. This is a fully automatic AK-47. It looks ugly, it sounds ugly, 
and scares people. Of course, this is the gun that most of the bad people in Mexico like. Mel Rodero is a federally licensed firearms or FFL dealer. We're here to find out how traffickers manage to purchase weapons in Texan gun stores. If somebody comes in and wants to buy a weapon from you, what are you required to do by law? When you are an FFL dealer, you can only sell to people in your state. They have to show some kind of proof of ID. They need to fill out one of these, okay? This is called the 4473. And they're gonna ask you, are you the actual buyer to the gun? They're gonna ask you, are you under indictment? Have you ever been convicted? All these kind of questions. Can they lie? Yes, they can. They can lie in the form. Because buyers must show identification, Mexican cartels often commission locals to buy weapons on their behalf. It's called a straw purchase. Since 2011, gun dealers must notify the authorities of multiple sales of certain guns. It's a regulation introduced by the Obama administration to make it easier to spot straw purchases. If you buy rifles that are magazine fed and above uh, 22 in caliber, you have to do a multiple sale for those two. But since President Trump's election, gun owners think tighter regulation is a thing of the past. It's been very, very slow. I love Donald Trump, okay? I'll say it right now. I love Donald Trump, but now that Trump won, everybody's happy that guns are not gonna go away and no one is buying anything, so we're in trouble now. We want to hear the traffickers' side, and a law enforcement officer has put us in touch with a Mexican police informer. This man used to work for the Gulf Cartel. Can you describe to me how the cartels are operating the weapons trafficking from the U.S. into Mexico? Las armas cortas se pasan caminando y las armas largas se desarman y las vamos clavando en diferentes vehículos para que tengamos esas armas en México. What about the Mexican security forces? Do they make a big effort to stop all of this? Ahí la corrupción está muy grande. Si tú no entras con nosotros a jugar, te matamos. Si estás en el puente, lo más seguro es que tú recibas dinero y si no te mato. O si no, mando matar a tu familia. And U.S. security simply has a different concern. As American border forces are more focused on drugs coming in than weapons going out, traffickers have adapted their business model. Ahora, ellos están ofreciendo armas por droga, que está más difícil yo, pues, para acusar la droga. Official data about trafficking is hard to come by, but some U.S. gun sellers have come to attention, such as this superstore chain called Academy Sports. It keeps coming up as a purchasing point of weapons that have been trafficked to Mexico. U.S. agencies are limited by law as to what data they can publish, but in 2011, a spreadsheet was leaked with thousands of gun traces, and Academy Sports features very prominently. Academy Sports comes up in nearly 100 traces, some linked to weapons recovered from the Zeta cartel. Now, because the data is a bit old, I've also gone through recent court documents, and Academy Sports has come up again as a place where U.S. agencies have mounted an undercover investigation into the illegal sale of firearms. Academy Sports didn't respond to our interview requests but has denied any wrongdoing in previous statements, adding that they have removed tactical weapons from open display. But the federal agency who investigated Academy Sports has agreed to see us. Hello. Hello, hi. It's called the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, or ATF. Nice Hello. to meet Very you. Very nice to meet you. Hello. Agents Frank Ortega and Nicole Strong work on cases that involve firearms trafficking. This was one of several uh, that was seized in a recent investigation. This gun was bought by two US citizens on behalf of a Mexican cartel. The investigation revealed a whole straw purchasing network, but their charge was based on lying on the paperwork. Seven of them have been prosecuted in federal court for providing false statements on the firearms transaction report. So, so what you're prosecuting them for is the fact that they filled in the form wrongly? Correct. There is 
currently no firearms trafficking uh, statute that we can prosecute someone for. In the absence of a targeted federal law, traffickers get off with minimal or no punishment. Nicole and Frank take us along the route where weapons are trafficked south. There are 52 border crossings between the US and Mexico, used by thousands of people every day. This one connects Brownsville with the city of Matamoros. What we're looking at in terms of we work, this is your front line. In spite of a massive drive to increase border security, the ATF has seen a series of budget cuts and the number of agents has been substantially reduced. President Trump wants to build a wall to keep refugees and migrants out of the United States. Do you think such a wall could ever stop the flood of American weapons going into Mexico? That's not the trend that we're currently seeing is they don't focus and they don't cross firearms by crossing the river. They cross them in vehicles uh, through the international bridges. What does it take to stop the weapons crossing the border? What we could really use is the firearms trafficking statute because that would allow us to go after not only the straw purchaser, but the entire network of people that are getting these guns to arm the cartel. But some legal gun sales take place virtually outside the law. Here in Texas, so-called private sellers can sell weapons without any background checks. Many private sellers use specialist websites and I have made contact. A former Texan law enforcement officer has agreed to help us. Since he still does private undercover work, we're hiding his face. Went onto arms list. There is actually somebody who is selling a Romanian AK-650. It's got the package, it looks new. The investigator takes over contact with the seller. He will show us how easy it is to buy a weapon completely anonymously. So you're texting with Tom now? Mm -hmm. I told him that I was only interested in uh, Romanian. The AK. AK. The vendor has at least four other rifles for sale. He just replied to me. He's saying the mag, question mark, it is in perfect condition, not in, a, not in a package. I will call you at noon to set up a meeting place. The seller wants to meet at this service station, a busy and public place. He's waiting with the AK-47 in the boot of his car. We record the audio. Hey, Tom. How are you, How are you doing, buddy? 650, right? Yes. Look at this, sir. No, no, just... The case and they gave the extra mag. Excellent. How's you want to count it? Gun guys are on us. Hey. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Within minutes, the deal is done. Later, in a private place, we meet to look at the purchase. It's an AK 47, the cartel's favorite weapon. I find that pretty extraordinary. I mean, this is a weapon that was designed for war, and it took you about five minutes to buy it. I think it took me about two minutes, less than two minutes. Did you at any point of time show identification? Did he ask anything about your second name? No, no. Who you were? No, it was just a cell. Right now it was me, experienced law enforcement. It could have been a cartel. To make sure the weapon doesn't end up in the wrong hands, we decide to destroy it. So this Kalashnikov actually broke the machine, but um, it's really hot, actually, really hot. But um, nobody's going to shoot this gun again, that's for sure. So what can American authorities do to keep track of firearms? Our next stop is a 1,000 miles north in West Virginia. It is here that the Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms traces weapons found at crime scenes including those in Mexico. We do trace U.S. source firearms for anywhere from 75 to 100 uh, foreign countries. In 2016 alone, the ATF traced nearly 10,000 weapons found in Mexico back to dealers and owners in the U.S. But American law stopped Neil from sharing details. Instead, he takes us on a tour. What you'll see are, are hallways and rows and rows of boxes. U.S. laws only allow the agency to keep records from gun dealers who are no longer in business. Each month, the ATF receives around two million paper documents. We're simply prohibited from creating any kind of a searchable database. Why? 
Uh, <laughs> it's, just it's, it's just the way the legislation is written. Even records submitted by dealers in electronic format must be reversioned. Guys here are the immediate conversion group. We receive the documents in electronic format. What we do is take that and um, make into image so that that's not searchable anymore. That means you're taking something that was easily searchable, electronically searchable, and you're making the search harder. Yes, that's what happens. If investigators want to trace a gun from a crime scene in Mexico or the US, ATF employees must navigate a mountain of paperwork. Your life is made so much more difficult by all these laws that restrict how you can actually do your work. Who's responsible for those laws? U.S. Congress is responsible for, for any of the laws, uh, particularly the federal gun laws, and it would be literally an act of Congress if that were to be changed. Washington, the place to find out who really shapes U.S. gun laws. A group of congressmen is bringing a bill which could further limit the ATF's ability to investigate trafficking. Our interview requests to them have gone unanswered, so we try to find them in person. Congressman Evan Jenkins is the sponsor of the proposed new law. Hi. Hello. I'm from Al Jazeera. I'm actually looking for Congressman Jenkins. His staff say they haven't received our emails and we are sent away. We go in search of the co-sponsors of the bill. Sorry, are you working with Congressman Massey? Hi, sorry, one question. Do you know if Congressman Heiss is uh, around today? He's um, at committee right now. We have records of our emails, but it's the same answer everywhere. I didn't get any requests from me. I'm his communications director. Right, OK. We've put in a few requests. We don't always get email requests. Sometimes they don't come through to my email inbox. Like, they go to a spam filter. Right. So, I'm so how, as the press, do we get in touch with you? Call. OK. But call we did, without results. Finally, we are in luck. Hi, good morning, Congressman. Yeah, how are you? Uh, very well, thank you. We know that you're supporting this bill which cancels the multiple reporting requirement for assault rifles. Now, the ATF is saying that's one of the few tools that they have to stop trafficking and straw purchasing. Can you just tell us why you support this because bill? Because the Second Amendment is very clear uh, limitation on the government's ability to uh, regulate firearms. And I think the uh, Second Amendment speaks for itself. I took an oath when I ran for Congress to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, and this bill is one of the ways I'm doing it. But it helps to prevent a crime. It helps to stop trafficking and straw purchasing. Congressman, aren't you interested in stopping crime? The Second Amendment of the US Constitution guarantees Americans the right to carry weapons. We know the Congressman is due at a meeting, so we wait again. Congressman, anything else beyond the Second Amendment? It's not the weapons that uh, do the crime, it's the people. There is a bill here that's an anti-trafficking bill. Would you vote in favor of that? I don't know what bill it is. I haven't read it. Would you like to have, can I show it to sure, you? Sure, I'd be happy to, but I've got to get to a committee hearing. Catch me this afternoon and I'll have looked at it. OK, right? thank you very much. We will do that. We called Congressman Farenholt's office several times thereafter. He never did provide a response. But Evan Jenkins, the sponsor of the proposed law, which would limit the ATF's investigative powers, sent a written statement. He says he wants to stop government intrusion into the lives of responsible gun owners. With President Trump now in power, laws that target trafficking have become much less likely to get passed. Here he is addressing the 2017 convention of the National Rifle Association who contributed over 30 million US dollars to his campaign. You have a true friend and champion in the White House. No longer will federal agencies be coming after law-abiding gun owners. At rallies across the country, Trump voters have urged him to construct a wall between Mexico and the US, a promise President Trump has vowed to deliver. That wall is going to help us, very importantly, with the deadly and heartbreaking consequences of illegal immigration, the lost lives, 
the drugs, the gangs, the cartels, the crisis of smuggling and trafficking. But do Trump and his supporters connect their freedom to buy guns with the destruction suffered by Mexico's people? If America intends to keep drugs and migrants out, it should get tougher on weapons going in. For now, the families of the disappeared are waiting for the violence to end. They want the search for their loved ones to finally begin.